In the world we live in today, we are told that the earth is a sphere. We are told that the circumference of that sphere is 24,901 miles. We are told that this sphere is rotating at a speed of over 1,000 miles per hour. This is 10 times faster than a professional baseball player's fastball. Faster than the speed of a bullet shot out of a handgun. Faster than the speed of sound. We are told that this sphere, while rotating at this speed, is also orbiting the sun at over 66,000 miles per hour. This is the equivalent of traveling from London to Beijing in five minutes flat. We are told that our solar system is rotating through the Milky Way galaxy at a speed of 483,000 miles per hour. We are told that our galaxy is traveling through the universe at 1.3 million miles per hour. And yet here we are, still, stationary, motionless. Questions begin to arise. Why is it that we see the same stars in the sky every night? Why is it that we can see distant objects that should have dipped below the horizon? Why is it that no matter how high we go, the horizon is always flat? Why is it that we feel nothing? The truth can be found in one place and one place only, and that is the Bible. Today, we'll be taking a tour through God's holy word to determine if we truly are on a fast-paced ball hurtling through a chaotic universe, or if there is another reality, one far more believable. In the world we live in today, we are told that the universe originated with an event known as the Big Bang. According to this theory, everything that has ever existed was originally condensed into a single small point. Then, that concentrated point exploded, shooting all matter into every direction, thus giving birth to what is known as the universe. The Bible, however, tells a completely different story. In the book of Genesis, we are given the account of creation. This is the record of how God created the earth. Genesis 1 verse 1 says, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. According to this verse, the earth is the result of God creating it, not the result of a giant explosion. But perhaps the theory of the Big Bang and the biblical account of creation are not contradictory. Perhaps, God used the Big Bang to create the earth. This idea becomes impossible after examining the sequence of the days of creation. God created the earth on the first day. God did not create the sun, moon, and stars until the fourth day. Therefore, there could not have been an explosion propelling all stars into every direction, simply because stars did not exist yet. 
There are other details in the theory of the Big Bang that do not line up with the Bible. First, the Big Bang supposedly took place 13.8 billion years ago. The Bible, however, says that God created everything that exists approximately 6,000 years ago. Secondly, the Big Bang Theory says that the universe is constantly expanding, becoming bigger and bigger every day. The Bible, however, says God finished creating the heavens on the sixth day. Genesis 2 verse 1 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. If the universe is currently expanding, that means that it is not finished. The Big Bang is simply an attempt to explain the world we live in today without including God in the equation. There was simply a small point of matter that then exploded. The Bible, however, tells us that this is impossible. Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. If the world is incorrect on how the earth was created, perhaps it is also wrong on what the earth is as well. Let's continue to investigate the creation account to get a better idea of what God actually created. We are told by the world today that the earth is a sphere. This sphere is commonly referred to as the globe. This lesson is taught in nearly every classroom all across the world. But let's take a closer look at the creation story to see if this truly is what God created. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2 say, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. So in the beginning, the earth was purely water. Now the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Is this body of water in the shape of a sphere, or is it resting flat? Think back to any time you've seen a body of water in your life. It could have been a small body of water such as a glass or a puddle, or it could have been a larger body of water, such as a lake or an ocean. Whenever you witness these bodies of water, did you ever notice the surface of the water curve? Of course not. The surface of the water, no matter how large or small, always rested flat. This is because bodies of water always seek to reach and maintain their level. This is important to understand because the earth was originally completely water. With the understanding that bodies of water do not curve, this rules out the possibility of this being a spherical body of water. It is safe to assume that this is a flat, resting body of water, just like every other body of water that has ever existed. In order to create a place within this water for mankind to live, God had to create a space for open air. Genesis 1 verses 6 and 7 say, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. So what God did was God created the firmament, a large, solid structure similar to a dome, that separated the water that was above it from the water that was below it. We can tell that the firmament is a solid structure because it is supporting the waters which are above it. Neither a gas nor a liquid could do that, only a solid. Genesis 1 verses 9 and 10 say, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Here, we see the body of water underneath the firmament being gathered together into seas, giving space for the dry land to appear, 
on which man and animals could live. Genesis 1 verse 8 says, And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. Here, we learn that another name for the firmament is heaven. This is because the Bible uses the word heaven to describe three separate things. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such an one caught up to the third heaven. This verse tells us that there are three separate heavens in the Bible. The first heaven is the sky, the place in which birds fly. An example of the Bible using the word heaven to refer to the sky is Revelation 19, verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. We know that this verse is referring to the sky, because that's the only height birds can reach. In addition, the word heaven in the Bible can refer to the place where God currently resides, above the firmament. This is what the Bible calls the third heaven. An example of the Bible using the word heaven in this way is Matthew 5, verse 16. The Bible says, Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And lastly, the word heaven can refer to the firmament itself, the solid dome which encapsulates the world we live in today. This is what the Bible calls the second heaven. The reader has to be able to distinguish from the context which heaven the Bible is referring to. Let's look at an example of when the Bible uses the word heaven to refer to the firmament. Approximately 1600 years after God created the earth, the number of men and women had multiplied greatly. Unfortunately, however, mankind had become exceedingly wicked. Genesis 6 verse 5 says, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Consequently, God decided to destroy the vast majority of mankind, saving just a handful of people. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, in the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In order to destroy mankind, God decided to use the means of a worldwide flood. Genesis 6 verse 17 says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth, to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life, from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. If you remember from Genesis chapter 1, the purpose of the firmament was to divide the waters above it from the waters that were below it. So what God did was God opened windows in the firmament, allowing the water which was above it to flow down into the earth. Genesis 7 verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. We know that this heaven is referring to the firmament because you can't make windows in an open space. You can only make windows in something solid, such as a wall. Eventually, so much of this water poured down through the firmament that even the mountains were submerged. Genesis 7 verse 19 and 20 say, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. 
A good way to picture it is this. Imagine drilling holes in the top of a snow globe and filling it with water. That is what God did to the earth. The flood would have been impossible on a spherical earth because you cannot flood a ball, much less a ball spinning at 66,000 miles per hour. Centripetal force would have flung the waters into every direction. After God had successfully wiped out the majority of mankind, God closed the windows in the firmament, causing the water flow to cease. Genesis 8 verse 2 says, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. Notice that in this verse, the windows of heaven and the rain are identified as two separate things. This is because the windows of heaven are not a poetic way of describing rainfall. They are literally windows in the firmament which is above us. This is not the only time that the firmament is mentioned being opened in the Bible. First, the firmament was opened at Jesus' baptism. Luke 3 verses 21 and 22 say, Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. In this verse, the firmament is being opened, and the Holy Ghost descends through that opening. Second, the firmament was opened at the stoning of Stephen. Acts 7 verses 55 and 56 say, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. In this verse, right before Stephen dies, he looks up through the firmament into heaven, and sees Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Third, the firmament was opened in the Apostle John's vision while on the island of Patmos. Revelation 4 verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. We know that this heaven is referring to the firmament because you cannot make a door in open air. You can only make a door in something solid, such as the firmament. And fourth, the firmament opens right before the battle of Armageddon. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Notice that in this verse, after the firmament opens, Jesus comes down through it, on a white horse. This is because on the opposite side of the firmament is God's throne. Ezekiel 1 verse 26 says, And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. So here we learn that above the firmament is God's throne. This is why the Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. According to this verse, God has stretched out the firmament as a tent for the world to dwell in, and he is sitting on top of that tent, and when he looks down from that vantage point, we all look like grasshoppers. In addition, notice that the Bible says that God is sitting upon the circle of the earth and not the sphere. This is because the earth is shaped as a circle. A circle is a two-dimensional object, and a sphere is a three-dimensional object. If God meant to say that
that he sat upon the sphere of the earth, he could have used the word sphere. Or he could have used the word ball, which he used a few chapters earlier. Instead, God purposely used the word circle because that's what the earth is, a circle. This relationship between the earth, the firmament, and God's throne can be most clearly seen in Revelation chapter 6. In this chapter, the Bible describes the second coming of Christ. Revelation 6 verses 14 through 16 say, And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. In these verses, the firmament is being rolled together, similar to how a scroll would be rolled together, allowing the inhabitants of the earth to see God sitting above them on his throne. In the Old Testament, one of Israel's prophets, named Elijah, is taken by God into heaven by a chariot of fire. The Bible says in 2 Kings 2, verse 11, And it came to pass, as they went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder, and Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. If there was an infinite amount of space all around us, this verse wouldn't make sense. Elijah would quickly die due to lack of oxygen. This verse only makes sense if heaven is located directly above us. The same is true of when Jesus ascended into heaven. Acts 1 verse 9 says, And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. The reason Jesus ascended up is because that's where heaven is, up. One group of people in the Bible actually tried to build a tower that reached all the way to heaven. This attempt is known as the Tower of Babel. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. While their efforts may have been futile, it nevertheless shows that they understood that heaven was directly above them. And they even thought that they could potentially reach it. You may be wondering, if the firmament really is above us, then what about rockets that I've seen being launched into space? Have you ever noticed that after rockets launch, they don't go straight up? They fly horizontal to the ground. Why would they do that? If they really were trying to reach something such as space, they would fly straight up. The reason they fly horizontal to the ground is because if they flew straight up, they would crash into an enormous ceiling. And what about satellites? Are those real? Have you ever noticed that satellite dishes don't span across the sky throughout the day? They point a single fixed direction. This is because satellites are not receiving signals from an object orbiting around our Earth. They are receiving signals from a radio tower, several miles away. If heaven is on the other side of the firmament, then that means there is no such thing as space. There is just the sky, the firmament, and then God's throne. This is important to understand because many people struggle with the idea of a flat Earth because they picture a giant disk soaring through the universe, similar to a frisbee flying through the air. This perception is flawed due to an underlying faulty assumption, and that assumption is this, that space actually exists. Unfortunately, it does not. And if space does not exist, the question must be asked, where exactly are the sun, moon, and stars?
We are told by the world today that the nearest star outside of our solar system is 4.4 light years away. This means that the nearest star is 24.94 trillion miles away. One of the fastest jets in the world is the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird with a top recorded speed of 2,071 miles per hour. If stars truly are that far away, it would take the Blackbird 1.4 billion years to reach the nearest star. According to the Bible, however, stars are much, much closer. Genesis 1 verses 14 and 15 say, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven, to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs, and for seasons, and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven, to give light upon the earth. And it was so. Notice that God placed the lights within the firmament, and not outside of it. This tells us that the stars are located in the sky directly above us. Have you ever noticed that we see the same stars, such as the North Star, in the same constellations, such as the Little Dipper, every night? This is because we are not traveling through a chaotic, ever-expanding universe. If we were, we would see different stars every night. Instead, we are on a stationary ground, and God has placed a set number of stars directly above us. Their distance away can be measured in miles and not in light years. The world also says that stars are enormous balls of gas, millions and millions of times larger than our Earth. According to the Bible, however, stars are much, much smaller. One way to prove this is because sometimes in the Bible, stars actually fall from heaven onto the earth. One example is Matthew 24, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Another example is Revelation 6, verse 13. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This is possible because stars are not enormous balls of gas ready to implode. Rather, they are small lights which God has placed within the firmament. This is why a star was able to guide the wise men to the location of Jesus. Matthew 2 verse 9 says, When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. The reason the star was able to move over the town of Bethlehem is because the star is a small body of light which God has placed within the firmament. If stars were trillions and trillions of light years away, they would not be able to rest over a single town. When it comes to the moon, we are told that it is a solid object, something we can land on. The Bible, however, says that the moon is something totally different. Genesis 1 verse 16 says, And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. According to this verse, the moon is a light of its own. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can see the blue sky behind the moon? This is because the moon is not a solid object. It is a light that shines fully at times and partially at other times. This is why the Bible says in Mark 13 verse 24, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. Notice, the Bible does not say that the moon will not reflect the sun's light. It says that it won't give her light. This is because the moon emits its own light. 
1 Corinthians 15 verse 41 says, There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon. Notice that the sun and moon have different glories. If the moon was a reflector of the sun, the sun and moon would have the same glories. This may be confusing because the world teaches us that the gravity of the moon is what causes the tides. The truth is, however, that gravity does not exist. We are told that gravity is the reason the oceans stay to the ground. If this were true, we would all be cemented to the surface of the earth. Birds would not be able to fly. Balloons would not be able to float. We would not even be able to lift a finger. The reason things drop to the ground is due to density, not gravity. Objects continue to fall until they come in contact with something denser than itself. You may be wondering, then what does cause the tides? The answer is magnetism. One of the characteristics of water is that it is diamagnetic. You may be wondering, what does diamagnetic mean? The word diamagnetic means that it is something that repels a magnetic field. Here's a brief video showing water being repelled by a magnet. Is water A. attracted by a magnet, B. repelled by a magnet, or C. completely non-magnetic? Most of you will answer C, and you wouldn't be wrong. After all, in everyday life you notice nothing unusual about water and magnetism. But interestingly enough, the correct answer is B. Water is actually slightly repelled by a magnet. This antimagnetic property is called diamagnetism. However, the effect is extremely weak. That's why most people don't know it's there. To see it, we need to build an extremely sensitive detector. Luckily, this is brutally simple. Just get a basin of water and put into it a styrofoam block. It's going to move around a lot, but this is actually a good thing. The styrofoam floats, and because it's so light, even the smallest force will push it around. So try and build this away from drafts and moving air, and be careful that your own breathing doesn't disrupt it. The water helps to dampen any stray motion. Now get a test tube and fill it with water and push it into the center of the styrofoam. This is the water we're actually going to measure, not the water in the basin. Now steady it, and when it's still, get a strong neodymium magnet and hold it as close as possible to the tube without touching it. Whoops, I hit it there. Let me uh, steady it. Okay, let me try again. Slowly but surely, it's moving away from the magnet. It's an extremely weak effect, but it's happening. So how does the diamagnetic property of water come into play with the tides? The sun and moon act as a battery in the sky, the sun having a positive charge and the moon having a negative charge. The sun's positive charge repels the water at low tide and the moon's negative charge attracts the water at high tide. This is why there is a constant rate of waves being thrown up on the seashore. The opposing forces of the sun and moon cause the ocean to be in a constant state of tumult. And as for the images which NASA has produced, they have all been created through Photoshop. Here is a testimony from Robert Simmon, a NASA CGI and Photoshop designer, admitting that the images of the globe are artificially created. Then in 2002, Blue Marble 2.0, NASA's Rob Simmon made this, and it had wide appeal too. For example, it ended up as the default background on the iPhone. I didn't even know until I bought an iPhone um, and turned it on and kind of did a little happy dance. Simmon's job is... It's primarily taking data and making pictures out of it. That's what this is, a composite of data sets from several different instruments translated into a picture. The, to us, the really cool thing was the data set. Up until that point, there was no realistic color map of the globe anywhere. So the land layer here comes from... The Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectral Radiometer aboard Terra. And the tricky part here was the weather. So we actually had to take clouds out. They stashed the clouds for later, went onto the ocean. That came from an instrument that measures phytoplankton in the sea. 
where it was low, I colored it dark blue because they're low mostly in mid-oceans. And then where it was a little bit higher, it was like a little bit brighter green. Then add the clouds back in. There's a small problem with it because there's a very slight gap in between each orbit. So some of those are painted on. It is photoshopped, but it's it has to be. Then? There was another layer to sort of simulate the atmosphere. And then there's this little bright spot. It's called the specular highlight. So it's the reflection of sunlight off of water. Those are the pieces, but you can't just slap them all together. It just didn't look realistic. It looks kind of flat, or the clouds are sort of too see-through. So I just hit Command-Z a lot. There's artistry to creating the world. It, what I imagine it to be. Um, unfortunately, I'm not an astronaut. <laughs> I've never been to space. but. I've looked at these images over and over again, trying to sort of get the essence of it. Have you ever noticed that when you look out of an airplane window, you seem to be on the same field as the sun? Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can see clouds behind the sun? Have you ever noticed that the sun's rays disperse from a single point in the sky? This is because the sun is not located 92 million miles away. It's actually much, much closer. The Bible says in Psalm 19 verses 1-4, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out throughout all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. According to these verses, the firmament is a tabernacle for the sun. A tabernacle is a tent-like structure, and God has placed the sun within that tent. Revelation 16 verses 7 and 8 say, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Notice that this angel, which is located in heaven, is pouring his vial upon the sun. This is because the sun is located below heaven, beneath the firmament. The world also tells us that the earth orbits the sun. This is impossible because the sun was created three days after the earth. There was an earth before there was ever a sun to orbit. Psalm 19 verses 4 through 6 say, Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. According to this verse, the sun has a circuit, or circular route, within the firmament. A good way to picture it is this. Imagine hanging a light bulb in the middle of a room. Then, imagine swinging that light bulb so that it goes in circles. That's what the sun is doing above the earth. It takes approximately 24 hours for the sun to make a full circuit over the earth, thus making a full day. The light from the sun covers approximately one half of the earth, while the light from the moon covers the other half. When the sun rises in the morning, that means that the sun is traveling towards us. At noon, the sun is directly above us, and in the evening, the sun is traveling away from us. This is why we feel no movement when we go outside. It is because the earth is not moving. It's the lights above us that move. This circular pattern can be most clearly seen by taking a time lapse of the night sky. You can see the star's circular pattern over the course of time. The circuit of the sun also has a large impact on the weather. 
Here is a recording of the weather on a flat earth. You can see how the course of the sun directly impacts the weather in its wake. The fact that the sun and moon move and not the earth can be most clearly seen in the book of Joshua. In this book, the Israelites have entered into the promised land and are fighting against the inhabitants of the land. With the help of the Lord, the battle is going well for Israel, and victory seems sure. Their commander, Joshua, desires more sunlight so that Israel can fully vanquish their foes. Consequently, Joshua prays for the sun and moon to stop moving. Joshua 10 verses 12 and 13 say, Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. Notice that Joshua told the sun and moon to stand still, not the earth. This is because the earth does not move. The sun and moon and stars do. This is why the Bible says in Habakkuk 3, verse 11, The sun and moon stood still in their habitation. At the light of thine arrows they went, and at the shining of thy glittering spear. In order for the sun and moon to stand still, they must have been moving previously. This is not the only time God caused the sun to stray from its normal circular pattern. In the book of Isaiah, the king of Israel, named Hezekiah, is sick and on the verge of death. Hezekiah prays to God, asking the Lord to heal him. God agrees to heal Hezekiah and gives him a sign to know that he will fulfill his promise. Isaiah 38 verses 7 and 8 say, And this shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord, that the Lord will do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which is gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, ten degrees backward. So the sun returned ten degrees by which degrees it was gone down. Notice that it is the sun that returns ten degrees, not the rotation of the earth. This is because the earth does not rotate. It is the sun that travels in a circular pattern above the earth. One of the most beautiful verses that disproves the idea that the earth is rotating around the sun is Revelation 8, verse 12. This verse says, And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. In this verse, an angel darkens one-third of the sun, moon, and stars, and the result is that one-third of the day is darkened. We are told that it takes approximately 365 days for the earth to fully orbit the sun. If this were the case, if God were to darken one-third of the sun, the earth would be in complete darkness for approximately 122 days out of the year and have daylight for approximately 243 days of the year. The effect would impact the earth on an annual level, not a daily level. On a flat earth, however, Revelation 8 verse 12 fits perfectly. The sun does a full circuit over the surface of the earth every 24 hours. If God darkened one-third of the sun and one-third of the moon, there would be eight hours of darkness every day and eight hours of darkness every night, just like the Bible said. According to the world we live in today, the Earth is currently rotating at a speed of over 1,000 miles per hour. According to the Bible, however, the earth is not moving at all. First Chronicles 16 verse 30 says, Fear before him all the earth, 
the world also shall be stable, that it be not moved. Psalm 93 verse 1 The Lord reigneth, he is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength, wherewith he hath girded himself. The world also is established, that it cannot be moved. Psalm 96 verse 10 Say among the heathen that the Lord reigneth. The world also shall be established, that it shall not be moved. He shall judge the people righteously. This is why airplane pilots are able to land their plane without difficulty. The runway is not moving at 1,000 miles per hour beneath them. The runway is standing still. The reason the earth does not move is because it is built upon a foundation. Job 38 verse 4 says, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Jeremiah 31 verse 37 Thus saith the Lord, If heaven above can be measured, and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel, for all that they have done, saith the Lord. Psalm 104 verse 5 Who laid the foundations of the earth, that it should not be removed forever? This is why the Bible says in Job 26 verse 4, he stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. The reason the earth is hanging upon nothing is because it is resting upon a foundation. And what lies within that foundation? The answer is hell. Amos 9 verse 2 says, Though they dig into hell, thence shall my hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Job 11, verse 8. It is as high as heaven. What canst thou do? Deeper than hell. What canst thou know? Proverbs 15, verse 24. The way of life is above to the wise, that he may depart from hell beneath. In fact, in the Bible, a group of rebels against God were actually swallowed up by the earth and fell into hell alive. In the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up, and their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods. They, and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit, and the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. The Bible tells us that Jesus, after dying on the cross for our sins, spent three days and three nights in hell. Acts 2 verse 31 says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. When speaking about Jesus' descent into hell, the Bible says, Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? According to this verse, hell is in the lower parts of the earth. You may be wondering, how does the fact that hell is below the ground prove that the earth is flat? The answer is because one of the names for hell in the Bible is the bottomless pit. An example of such a verse is Revelation 20 verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. If hell were in the center of a spherical earth, hell could not be a bottomless pit. If you went far enough down, you would eventually reach the other side of the earth. But on a flat earth, a bottomless pit would make perfect sense. The world tells us that the earth is a sphere with a diameter of nearly 8,000 miles. If the earth truly is a sphere this size, then that means that objects should drop lower and lower in our vision the farther they travel away from us, due to the curvature of the earth. The formula to calculate the drop in height is 8 inches multiplied by the number of miles away the object is squared. This formula tells you how far distant objects should have dropped on a spherical earth. For example, 
If something were 10 miles away, that means it should have dropped 800 inches, or approximately 67 feet. The only problem with this formula is that things don't drop the farther and farther they go. They remain at the same height. For example, this is a picture of the Chicago skyline. This picture was taken from 52 miles away. According to the formula, the Chicago skyline should have dropped over 1,800 feet. The tallest tower in Chicago is the Willis Tower, rising over 1,451 feet. Therefore, even the tallest tower in Chicago should be completely out of view from where this photo was taken. Proofs that the Earth is flat exist all around us. Sailors who can see lighthouses from miles out at sea. Airplane pilots who can see mountain ranges from several states away. Beachgoers who can see distant ships approaching. This same concept, the ability to see distant objects, even exists within the Bible. In the book of Daniel, we are told about a tree in King Nebuchadnezzar's dream. A tree so tall, you can see the ends of the earth from the top of it. Daniel 4 verse 11 says, The tree grew, and was strong, and the height thereof reached unto heaven, and the sight thereof to the end of all the earth. On a globe, this would be impossible, because the curvature of the earth would hide the ends of the earth. But on a flat earth, such a view would be possible. A similar instance is when Satan tempts Jesus in the wilderness. Matthew 4 verse 8 says, Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. On a globe, no matter how high the mountain was, it would be impossible to see all the kingdoms. But on a flat earth, it would be possible. And there are other verses that only make sense on a flat earth. For example, in Revelation 1 verse 7, when speaking about the second coming of Christ, the Bible says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, Amen. According to this verse, when Jesus returns, every single person on earth will see him coming in the clouds. This would be impossible on a globe, because the curvature of the earth would hide Christ's coming from more than half the world. A certain hemisphere would be facing the wrong direction. And while many would argue that they will see Jesus coming on a television set, the fact remains that a significant portion of the world does not have access to television. The only way that every eye would be able to see Jesus is if the surface of the earth is flat. This is why airplane pilots, when traveling long distances, do not need to dip their nose except when landing. They simply need to ensure that the plane is traveling straight. This is because they are traveling over a flat surface. This is why surveyors, when designing large architectural blueprints for things such as bridges, railroad tracks, and highways, do not include any allowance for the curvature of the earth in their calculations. They operate under the assumption that they are going to build their structure on a flat surface. In addition, the Bible often uses terms to describe the earth that can only apply to a flat surface. For example, Genesis 1 verse 29 says, And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth. Notice, the Bible says the face of all the earth, face being singular. A flat surface has one face, otherwise known as a side. A sphere, however, has four faces, each facing a different direction. In addition, the Bible often says that the earth has ends. For example, 
In Job 28, verse 24, the Bible says, For he looketh to the ends of the earth, and seeth under the whole heaven. Psalm 67, verse 7, God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear him. Spheres do not have ends. If you were to try and find one, you would go around and around forever. A flat earth, however, does have ends. You may be wondering, if the earth does have ends, then what are they? And that brings us to the final component of our flat earth model, and that is the ice wall. If you've ever heard of Flat Earth before, you've probably wondered, what's at the end? The answer is a giant shelf of ice. You may know this shelf of ice by a different name, and that is Antarctica. The world tells us that Antarctica is a continent, the only continent that has never been inhabited by mankind. This idea, however, contradicts with the Bible. Genesis 11 verse 8 says, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. According to this verse, after the progress of the Tower of Babel was stopped, God caused mankind to be scattered throughout the whole earth. This means that every single continent has been inhabited. Antarctica, however, has never been inhabited. The reason Antarctica has never been inhabited is because Antarctica is not a continent. It is a giant shelf of ice that compasses the face of the whole earth. Proverbs 8 verse 27 says, When he prepared the heavens, I was there, when he set a compass upon the face of the depth. Job 26 verse 10 says, He hath compassed the waters with bounds, until the day and night come to an end. Notice, the Bible uses the word compassed. To compass something means to circle it. This is because the earth is a circle. The majority of that circle is water. And what is keeping that water in? The answer is a giant shelf of ice. One of the most creative descriptions of this ice wall can be found in Job 38 verse 14. The Bible says that it may take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it. It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. When a seal is used to press down a stamp, it leaves a raised circle around the edges. This is similar to how the ice wall looks in relation to the earth. It compasses the whole face of the earth as a raised edge. So we have completed our model of the earth. We have the firmament, a glass-like dome overarching the face of the earth. Above the firmament, we have heaven, where God's throne is. Below the firmament, we have a circle covered by land and sea. Within the firmament, we have sun, moon, and stars traveling in a circular pattern. Below the ground, we have the foundations of the earth, and within that foundation is hell. And around the perimeter, we have a giant ice wall holding in the oceans. This matches both with what we can gather with our senses and with what we read in the Bible. And now, after having gone through all this, the question must be asked, where in the Bible does it say that the earth is a globe? Where in the Bible does it say the earth is rotating on an axis? Where in the Bible does it say the earth is orbiting the sun? Where in the Bible does it say that we are traveling through a galaxy? Where in the Bible does it say that space even exists? The fact is that it doesn't. There isn't a single verse in the entire Bible that even hints that the earth is a sphere. It is simply an illusion perpetuated 
by the media. And now, the last question of all, and that is, why? Why does the shape of the earth matter? Why does it matter if the earth is flat or a sphere? Why not just leave the whole issue alone? The answer is because many people do not believe in God because of a lie that science has told them. Satan is cunning and no lie that he devises is without purpose or harm. And the globe is no exception. The last thing Satan wants mankind to think about is God. He wants them to get lost in the chaos and confusion of this life and not give a single thought to their creator. The idea of an infinite universe fits perfectly with this plan. In the heliocentric model, Earth is nothing, one of many planets in one of a million solar systems in one of a million galaxies in an innumerable number of universes. We're just a dot in an infinite sea of darkness. But in the biblical model, the Earth, and more specifically, mankind, is God's greatest work of art, something he took time and pleasure in creating. And he sits immediately above it, looking down on everything that takes place within his creation. Isaiah 45 verse 18 says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, God himself that formed the earth, and made it. He hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is none else. Satan does not want man to know that his creator is above them. Satan wants us to think that God does not exist. And if Satan can't convince us of that, he wants us to think that God is millions of light years away, in a distant universe that we will never reach. And the farther away he is physically, the farther he will become mentally. How many Christians would feel a greater sense of comfort if they knew that their God was right above them? How many atheists would reconsider if they knew that science had told them a lie? How many people would get saved if they realized that hell was waiting right underneath their feet? The majority of people, Christians and non-Christians alike, will continue to mock the idea of a flat earth, esteeming it nothing more than a caveman's theory. But the truth is that God created the flat earth and not man, and those that mock the flat earth do not mock man but their creator. But those who understand the truth and cherish it will reap the benefits of a deepened relationship with their savior and creator. So our message to every Christian who has been disheartened by the shame, laughter, and ridicule associated with the flat earth is this. Do not be discouraged. The earth is undoubtedly flat. Be thankful that God has allowed you to see the truth. And remember that God is sitting above us, and he knows who stands for the truth and who opposes it. Thank you for watching. We pray this documentary has been a blessing to you. If we don't see you on this side of the firmament, we'll see you on the other. God bless.